missile defense in order to protect us from attack. Iraq, one of the rogue states, Iran, North Korea, and now they throw China into that equation. For the last three years, the Pentagon has been trying to make China the new boogeyman, and China unwittingly played into the United States' hands with its anti-satellite test. But it seems that not everybody in the U.S. was surprised by the Chinese anti-satellite test. At the time, I was at a conference uh, in Colorado Springs, uh, and the military officers in the room actually left to watch the test uh, in real time. So they were observing the actual Chinese anti-satellite test. We know about every space launch. We know about every rocket launch. We have reconnaissance and surveillance satellites that can detect all these. We detected the Chinese test, for example. And in fact, we detected the two previous Chinese tests that failed. So we know about this. It's extremely difficult to hide uh, space tests. They're one of the most observable weapons tests you can possibly imagine. But blowing up satellites, your own or someone else's, has very physical consequences as well as political ones. At the Air Force Academy in Colorado Springs, the cadets understand that mastery of space has consequences. It's simple orbital mechanics. It's hard to obtain space superiority without attacking, so I'm afraid that if we want space superiority, we're going to have to attack enemy's assets, which uh, I don't know if you know much about orbital mechanics, but if you created debris up in space, that would just get in the way for you as well, and it kind of started chain reaction, and pretty soon you just have a cloud of debris surrounding Earth. There are roughly 600,000 pieces of our space garbage currently orbiting the Earth. All of these objects are traveling at 14,000 miles an hour. So even an object the size of a pea traveling at that speed has more force than a, than a cannonball. Right now, the problem with space junk is so high that NASA is worried that if there is never another launch of anything into space, because every launch creates a little bit of debris, in 50 years' time, certain orbits will be so polluted that nobody can operate there because the stuff that's already up there will start breaking up and creating more and more clutter. One year after the Chinese anti-satellite test, the U.S. destroyed one of its own satellites in orbit. These kinds of tests risk increasing the amount of space garbage. The point really is, is creation of debris in this manner uh, a good idea or a bad idea and clearly it is a very bad idea because there's no way to go up and clean that up the more uh, times you uh, go into space and you begin to practice destroying other uh, satellites you create so much space junk that you literally create the very likely possibility that at some point in time you will not be able to get a rocket off the planet Earth because it'll be like a minefield around the planet and you won't be able to escape the minefield with that rocket because it would be destroyed by all the space junk there. So we've got to begin to look at space as an environment. Space junk grew again in early 2009 with the debris from the collision of two satellites, one American and one Russian. We have several hundred billion dollars of investment in the peaceful uses of outer space. I'm talking about weather satellites, positioning satellites, scientific satellites, the entire world communication network is all satellite oriented. All this incredible investment from the United States and from the European Union and Canada and other countries like this, all this is completely a jeopardy if we start putting weapons in outer space.
This is our larger laboratory, and uh, off to this side, we have freshmen or first-year cadets working on components of our FalconSat 5 satellite that we're in the process of designing, and we'll be testing those at Kirtland Air Force Base in New Mexico. Is there any, uh... Cadet Tuttle's father was in the Air Force, so Tuttle grew up wanting to fly. He's also picking up other skills for the age of space technology. These are going to be the sides of the satellite. These are the only two panels done so far, and we need to get six done, so uh, we got a lot of work to do, but hopefully we'll be done in about two weeks. The rest of the world understands that the U.S. is planning to militarize space, of course. Uh, so there have been efforts to uh, renew and extend the uh, Outer Space Treaty. It says weapons of mass destruction can't be in space. It doesn't say other things. And there have been attempts to renew it, just to affirm it, and to strengthen it. Now the U.S. blocks it every year. We do indeed need a United Nations treaty. This is not enough. This is only step one. Step two says, OK, space has been militarized. There are military networks in space. Many of them, like GPS, are useful. But we should work on international treaties to make those military space networks used for multilateral purposes. Do I think that's going to happen? I'm, I'm very doubtful, but I have to keep hoping and believing that there is a prospect for that. But the election of Barack Obama seemed to offer the possibility of a change in the U.S. position. I will cut tens of billions of dollars in wasteful spending. I will cut investments in unproven missile defense systems. I will not weaponize space. Soon after he took office in January 2009, the White House stated that it would be seeking a worldwide ban on weapons that interfere with military and commercial satellites. But it's proving tough to change decades of entrenched military policy to weaponize space. History suggests that nations do not voluntarily disarm. They disarm because they're defeated, or they make small adjustments in the way they buy and build and deploy their weapons. But no superpower says, you know, it would be better if we were weaker. I don't recall that ever happening. The Obama administration's 2010 defense budget requested close to a billion dollars that was applicable to space warfare systems. It included a new program called Offensive Counterspace. The Pentagon defined this as offensive measures to disrupt, deny, degrade, or destroy any adversary's space capabilities. It's kind of like what happened after World War II. We had the atomic bomb. Nobody else had the atomic bomb. We thought we had a big exclusive, and with our atomic weaponry, we would be able to dominate the Earth. It didn't last very long. The Soviets had an atomic bomb. The Chinese had an atomic <laughs> Likewise in space, to think that we can move up there with weaponry and be alone to be the, the king on the, uh, the throne of space it's a tragic miscalculation. It's probable that more countries will decide that their national space programs must also be used for national defense. Japan has lifted its ban on military use of space. Iran is pursuing an ambitious space program. So far, the European Union remains opposed to the weaponization of space. But for how much longer?
si les Américains continuent de placer des armes, non plus des satellites militaires, mais des armes dans l'espace, il va peut-être falloir qu'on y réfléchisse et qu'on envisage au moins les moyens euh, de se défendre ou de faire face, alors on ne dit pas à, à la menace américaine, mais à l'éventuelle course aux armements qui pourrait en découler. Russia has said that if the United States fulfills its plan to position weapons in space, it will develop countermeasures to destroy any orbiting threat. If Americans deploy space-based uh, anti-ballistic uh, missile defenses, then could you imagine interceptors based on uh, space uh, stations, military stations, would overfly territory of Russia or territory of uh, China, that would be considered as a quite unacceptable, I think, for Russians. The potential victims are not going to say, uh, here's my throat, please cut it. They know that they're a potential target, and if uh, the U.S. were to develop space weapons, they'd be completely defenseless unless they destroyed it somehow or developed a deterrent. And deterrents are known. So, for example, nuclear weapons are a deterrent. Uh, terror is a deterrent. Now, that's why aggressive militarism uh, leads to an extension of proliferation and terror. Как известно, уже не фантастика, а реальность еще в середине 80-х годов. Такая политика является, конечно, катализатором гонки вооружений. Доминирование фактора силы неизбежно подпитывает тягу ряда стран к обладанию оружием массового уничтожения. Are we looking to a future on Earth, where we're surrounded by an outer layer of weapons? If we move to weaponization of space, uh, we can bid farewell to the planet. Now, the chances of survival are very slight. Every year, the U.S. Air Force Academy welcomes its best graduates to be space warriors, masters of the high ground. Usually we're uh, trying to bring back weapon systems after they've been deployed, nuclear missiles, we're trying to bring them back. Here's an opportunity, one of the first times in history, actually, that we have a chance to be proactive, that we have a chance to stop a new arms race before it actually happens. That's why this moment is so crucial. The debate over space weaponization is the most critical debate for the next century, and we are on the verge of making decisions in many nations around the world about which path to choose.